Alrighty, so this is a brief review of chapter 10, which for some reason tries to combine too many theories into one chapter. Alright, so first up is labeling theory. And there's like a whole bunch to it, so I'll try and go through it clearly. Okay, so labeling theory is really a perspective that is focusing on certain questions, like who is applying a deviant label to whom, and who establishes and enforces rules. It's important to understand how criminal or deviant behavior is defined or labeled, and these scholars were also interested in how society reacts to this labeled behavior. So, not that anything is inherently right or wrong, just that how someone reacts to a behavior is what defines it as deviant. So the foundation of labeling theory comes, you know, from symbolic interactionism, which, you know, of course argues that we derive meanings through interactions, and they focus on how an individual's personality and thought processes evolve through those interactions, such as a symbolic language or gestures or things like that. So one of them is uh, Charles Horton Cooley. You know, he basically says that an, indiv an individual will gain a sense of his or herself through their primary groups or their significant others, meaning the people that you spend the most time with, right? And the people you have the closest identification with. So he identified the process of an individual obtaining a self-image through the eyes of others, what he called the looking glass self. The we get an image of ourself reflected in how others see us. So he argued that primary groups are just those, you know, groups that are most important to us, our intimate and personal interactions, the people that we trust or talk to. Um, let's see, William Thomas basically was looking more at um, development later in life because Cooley was looking you know more um, at parts of identity and how we understand that at a younger age. William Thomas is looking at the adult self, how we redefine the adult self. So he argued that to understand human behavior we have to understand the total situation which is basically what he says that you know when people agree upon a set scenario that becomes the definition of the situation. So, you know, there's certain subjective factors or subjective definitions that we all have, but when we're together, we typically have some sort of definition of the situation or what he calls a total situation. So, you know, if there's a fire, um, usually that means, you know, there's something bad going on or something like that. The definition of, of how we react is typically what we read on others, right? So in a crisis or in a situation of, of something like that, typically people will look at each other to see how the others are reacting, to try and get a cue as to how they should react. And then uh, George Herbert Mead was looking at two types of social interaction, non-symbolic and symbolic interaction. So non-symbolic is basically just when people respond to gestures or actions, but symbolic is when individuals interpret those gestures or actions and put meanings to them. You know, so it's not like we can really read each other's minds. Uh, we take others' evaluations of us, but we don't exactly know what they think of us, right? So um, in a lot of ways, it's our interpretation of what they're doing. So Mead was primarily interested with symbolic interaction. Specifically, he was looking at the interpretation, you know, trying to understand the meanings or remarks of other people and how that would give indications as to how we are supposed to act. So part of that is just that if you're stigmatized, then, you know, if people say that you're bad or you're a deviant, then you're going to be predisposed to take on a deviant self-identity. Meaning like, you know, George Herbert Mead would look at it the other way too. If you are praised as a good kid or a smart kid, then you're more likely to identify as a smart kid. It just makes sense that, you know, we're, we're the product of these interactions with each other. And Goffman really looked at stigma. So he said this was something that you know, diminishes a person as a, as a full human and that we typically exclude someone if they're stigmatized, right? So like being a criminal, having a felony label, being an ex-con, right? There's a stigma to that. There's this kind of like, ooh, you're a criminal, you did something wrong, you're a bad person, which means that we kind of dehumanize someone is not quite a whole person, right? And then typically they're kind of tainted from social interactions. So typically we will you know, restrict their access to things or kind of push them to the margins and not really accept them, right? So he, you know, Goffin was looking at how stigmatized individuals differ 
from normal people just in the way that they react and the way that people react to them. So going on from there, um, Frank Tannenbaum focused on the process that occurs after an individual has been caught and designated as having violated the law. So he says there's a gradual shift from the definition of the specific act as evil to the definition of the individual as evil. Something that he calls the dramatization of evil. So this is the community's point of view or the social reaction to illegal behavior. The process of making criminal, someone criminal, involves tagging them, defining them, identifying them, and typically that results with the person becoming the thing that they were described as being, right? So if you were a crazy, a killer, a maniac, then in a lot of ways, that kind of dramatization of evil has an influence on making that criminal more than any other experience. So he's saying that, you know, in this kind of understanding of labeling theory, acts are not inherently good or bad. There are differing degrees of good and bad. And the social reactions that we get influence how those behaviors are labeled, right? So these behaviors are placed within a context that includes such factors as a person's social status and the social setting. So oh, terrible example of that could be um, the Weinstein versus Trump situation, right? Different social status, different social setting. Um, both high profile men accused of um, sexual harassment and sexual assault over uh, decades. Um, one has a fall from grace, one does not. Um, the social reactions that people have influence how the behavior is labeled. So the fact that people go, ah, oh, they're just lying, or you have uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, it's fake news, um, that's going to affect how those women um, that are accusing Donald Trump are labeled or understood, right? And that's going to kind of, you know, shift the focus to people like Weinstein, Bill O'Reilly, Roger Ailes, I mean, I could, like, there's a thousand of them, um, that have had falls from grace that, you know, in the same tone, though, you could see, like, what happened with Cosby. Um, same thing at the beginning. It was like, oh, these women are crazy. What are they talking about? And then eventually people realize, oh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 people come out and talk about it. And it, the community's viewpoint to this changes, right? Basically, the, the definition of predator becomes our understanding of Cosby. And rightfully so, right? So anyway, that they're basically talking about how the social reactions influence how the behaviors are labeled. And so this is kind of where it really matters what the cultural context is, especially when it comes to these things like sexual assault or rape or sexual harassment. We live in a rape culture, meaning our culture tends to justify these things or blame women that are victims of it for not somehow protecting themselves from aggressive people. Um, instead of like with any other crime, you'd be like, oh, that's terrible, someone victimized you. You're not like, well, why were you wearing a nice watch? You knew someone was going to try and rob you. Like, you know, anyway. So it's just interesting how the, the social reaction has everything to do with the cultural value system, right? Anyway, um, so then Lemert kind of takes this to another level where he talks about primary and secondary deviance. He says that primary deviance is a behavior that's situational or occasional. So typically, this is where, you know, someone might be doing something, but they have norm or like rationalizations for what they're doing. So they're usually kind of, um, these acts are done through normalization um, or through minimal controls. So it doesn't really hinder the person from getting along with other people. Um, and typically, the person engaging in primary deviance uh, perceives the behavior um, in a certain way. So it just means that um, the, they might see the behavior as bad, but they don't see themselves as a bad person. So primary deviance could be something like, <clears throat> I don't know, um, when I was in high school, I used to, uh, like, there was a lot of lunch breaks where I went out to the parking lot with the bad kids and would smoke a cigarette. Right? That was kind of my cool guy thing. And, um, you know, just get, you know, lung cancer for no reason. But anyway, um, and it's interesting, like, in that same way, in the beginning, before you've really... Um, gotten in trouble for these things. It's just kind of like a thing you do once in a while, right? Like a lot of people would, um, you know, like let's say in high school, drink at a party, right? It's not something you do every day, but you drink at that one party and you rationalize it, right? Like, oh, well, it's just this one party, you know, it's not a big deal. It's underage drinking, but it's not that big a do of a deal. And it's done through this normalization, like, oh, well, other people drink at parties. That's pretty normal, right? And everyone else here is, so it's fine if I am. And then basically the person themselves know that underage drinking is wrong, right? They understand that they shouldn't be drinking, 
but they don't see themselves as bad for doing it, right? They just see it as like, well, it's normal. This is a thing that people do, right? Once it skips into secondary deviance, this is deviant behavior or the social roles that are based on it that become a means of defense or attack or like an adaptation to the, you know, the problems that are caused by the reaction to the primary deviance. So a person that's engaging in secondary deviant behavior uses their behavior as a way to kind of adjust to the problems that are related to the original behavior. So basically, <laughs> the way it works is like, um, once, you've, once you've skipped over into secondary deviance, this is where um, people are going to start looking at you as the problem and not as your behavior is the problem, right? So um, let's say you drink occasionally at a party, but one time you get really drunk and you throw up everywhere and like make a huge fool of yourself, right? Then that's kind of going to spill into the secondary deviance part where, you know, what you start doing, you start changing your social role to adapt to that happening, right? So like, let's say um, this happens to you and people are like, oh, she's such a, you know, uh, this or that, right? You know, teens love to label each other. Um, so basically, once you've been labeled as the drunk or the party kid or something like that, then that's going to affect your identity, right? That's going to affect the way that you respond to that, right? So some people are going to respond to that like no and not drink anymore and, you know, that could be their reaction. But a lot of people are going to be kind of very strongly influenced by the label itself. Meaning if someone says, oh, you're the person, the kind of person that skips class and goes to parties or whatever, then maybe you actually become more of that person, right? So instead of doing it once in a while, as most teens do, it becomes part of your identity. And then you start doing it more and more as a way to like defend the time that you got too drunk at that party or just kind of like deal with the social reaction to the behavior, which is not good. So typically, this, he has like a specific sequence of events of how these things work. Typically, it works like you have your primary deviation. There's some sort of social penalty, right? Like you get in trouble for drinking or something like that. Then you drink again, right? Further primary deviation. And then there's stronger, stronger penalties and rejections, right? Like that's the part where your parents are like, we're disappointed in you and <laughs> you're grounded or whatever. And then basically, once you get past the stronger penalties and rejections, if you do that deviance again, you further deviate, then typically that's when you're kind of pushing past that boundary with hostility or resentment towards the people that are punishing you. Like it's like sneaking out when you're grounded or something like that. Like you have this power force telling you um, that you're not allowed to do something. Of course, we could look at this. It doesn't have to be in like a very suburban middle class way. We could look at this like you could be imprisoned, right? So drinking at a party, um, versus getting arrested for a DUI is the second time, right? That's the stronger penalties and rejections. You lose your car, you lose your freedom, uh, you lose your license. And if you then go out and drive anyway, because you're like, screw this, I don't care, this is stupid, I'm just going to drive on my suspended license, I'm still going to drink and drive, that's that future further deviation that's like pushing past with resentment. And that typically reaches this kind of like what he calls a tolerance quotient, which basically, you know, because why not put math in this, right? Basically, is a way to express the formal action of the community stigmatizing the deviant and strengthening of the deviant conduct as a result of the stigma. So basically, like, the person gets punished and stigmatized, so they do it even worse, and then they get, like, stigma even worse, so then they do it even worse. It just strengthens the deviant conduct. And so ultimately, this person accepts their deviant role and starts making efforts to adjust to that role. So a key aspect of secondary deviance is not only society's reaction to the behavior, but the individual's response to that reaction. Do they say, okay, I won't drink anymore, I won't go out anymore, mom and dad, or, you know, do they sneak out past their curfew? Do they still drive on the suspended license? Those kind of things. It's the individual's response to the reaction as well as the reaction. All right, and then Becker gets into labeling theory because that because we didn't already go through enough people, right? Anyway, so Becker, he's great, actually. He's really interesting. So Becker talks about what he calls the, these outsiders, right? He refers to individuals that are considered by others to be deviant as people that are outside of what's considered normal circles, right? So he says that social groups create deviance 
by making rules whose infractions are considered deviants, and by applying those rules to particular people, they can label them as outsiders. So a key aspect to labeling deviants is to realize that certain groups have power to impose rules or labels more so um, than others, and some can impose them onto certain groups. So this power differential results in the group with authority um, having the power to basically figure who's a deviant or who's an outsider. So deviance has two dimensions in this way, he says, that only those behaviors that are considered deviant by others are really deviant, and it's whether or a behavior act conforms to a certain rule. So again, it's not that deviance is right or wrong, it's just really what's normal, right, to that group. So he also says that, you know, there's a typology of deviant behavior. So there's conforming behavior, right, meaning obeying the rules of society, you know, that they want you to do. There's what he calls the pure deviant, a person who disobeys the rules and just doesn't care about it, right? There's also what he calls the falsely accused, right? Someone who's been identified as disobeying the rules, but they didn't actually do anything wrong. And then there's what's called the secret deviant, right? A person who violates the rules, but society does not react to this behavior. So this could be someone in a powerful or, or prestigious position where um, they're still doing deviant things, but we look the other way because of the, their status. Okay, and then Edwin Schur, um, basically he addressed some of the criticisms and misunderstandings of the labeling perspective. So he noted that some scholars argued that labeling theory didn't adequately distinguish between deviants and non-deviants. Because in the labeling perspective, there's certain attempts to explain the varieties of deviant acts, but you know they're not just kind of saying like people commit them or not. And so there are various criticisms that argue labeling perspective is too narrow uh, because the focus is on the ascribed aspect of the deviant status rather than the motivation, right? So you're like, okay, a person did this. Like, they are labeled for doing something wrong. But it's not really saying, like, well, then how do you stop them from doing it again? They don't really look at that. So, you know, basically, um, also not every form of deviance are they really accounting for, right? And so a lot of it just has to do with the definitional processes that aren't that clear, so, um, you know, he says there's certain key factors in the labeling process, um, such as stereotyping. So this is usually associated with racial prejudice and discrimination. And stereotyping can also occur in police encounters with juveniles. So during various decision-making stages of these encounters, police react to various cues given by the juvenile. So meaning like, you know, um, whether they arrest someone or just shake them down or let them go or something, it's going to have something to do with that interaction process. And so certain cues the youth can give can give certain affiliations, like their age, their race, their grooming, right? Their dress, their demeanor, how they speak. Um, so kind of going back to that code of the street, being able to code switch, right? Knowing how to talk to the street element and to the kind of more middle class element, right? And then there's um, retrospective interpretation. So this is a process by which an individual is identified as a deviant and is thereafter viewed in a new light. Right? Meaning that you're given like a new personal identity and people don't look at you the same because of something you did. So this is the most dramatic way of initiating. This is usually through some sort of public status degradation, um, which obviously a lot of criminal trials arguably are that. Like let's say you are convicted of a, sp a certain crime. That's going to retrospectively you know, change the interpretation of you. You're going to be seen differently from then on. right? And then there's negotiation. So this is where, you know, alleged delinquents may try to influence their disposition by exploiting the relationship between the image they're presenting and the outcome of their case. So it's kind of the thing of like, think of it this way, like always wear a suit to court, right? That's negotiation. That's the idea that social class matters. Um, it shouldn't, right? We should actually like care about people and we should just like respect them all at the same base level, but we don't. Right? That's just our society stratified AF. So in reality, what we have to do is um, negotiation is just this process of trying to have a more favorable outcome by presenting yourself as more acceptable to society. So you wear your suit to court or something like that instead of your, you know, you know, uh, I don't know, cargo shorts and a t-shirt or something. Because you're trying to hopefully get a better outcome. All right, so some basic assumptions of labeling theory. Hint on your exam. Okay. 
So one is that no act is intrinsically criminal. So it's not the acts themselves, it's how we understand or define those acts. Also, criminal definitions are enforced in the interest of the powerful, right? They're the people who get to dictate what is right or wrong. A person does not become a criminal by violating the law, right? It's not through violating the law, it's through being labeled as deviant. The practice of dichotomizing individuals into criminal and non-criminal groups is contrary to common sense and research. And they also argue that only a few persons are caught violating the law, even though many may be equally guilty. Some more, because you wanted some more of these. While sanctions used in law enforcement are directed against the individual, and not just the criminal act, the penalties for an act vary according to the characteristics of the, of the offender. So obviously, your age, your social class, your race, your gender, that's going to matter in the criminal justice system as to how long of a, um, a even if you, if you get convicted or not, um, your chance of conviction, um, how long your sentence will be, those things vary based on the person itself, which it shouldn't, but it does. Um, criminal sanctions also vary uh, according to each other based on the characteristics of the offender. So, you know, what kind of sentence, um, how long, what kind of punishment, those things are all affected. So criminal justice is founded on a stereotype conception of the criminal as a pariah, meaning that the person who committed a crime willingly did something wrong, they deserve the community's condemnation, they're not quite a person, right? And so confronted by public condemnation and the label of an evil man, an offender might find it difficult to maintain a favorable image of himself. There's this kind of thing where if you're told that you're a bad person over and over and over, you start to believe it. Right? That's kind of where labeling theory is coming through this. All right, so some research on and critiques of labeling theory. So empirical studies of labeling theory have been conducted by researchers for a long time. And in the field of criminal justice, a central focus of research for a number of studies was the process of deviance ampli amplification due to labeling an individual a criminal or a delinquent. So Schwartz and Skolnick examined the effect of an employee's criminal court record and the reaction of potential employers. And the results revealed that only one employer demonstrated an interest in a convicted person. Three had an interest in someone that was tried but acquitted. Six had interest in someone that was tried and acquitted with a letter from a judge. And nine um, were interested in the no criminal record folder. So the individual accused but acquitted has almost as much trouble finding an unskilled job as someone who was not only accused of the same of offense but also convicted. So even just coming in contact with the criminal justice system is really going to give you stigma. That's basically what that means. Um, so then there's Rosenhan who examined how the label of insanity can influence the behavior and perceptions of hospital staff. So we looked at eight individuals from various backgrounds that were deemed sane and they applied for admission to different mental hospitals. Upon arrival, they all pretended to be schizophrenic and said they were hearing voices. And when they were questioned about their background and significant life events, they all gave truthful and accurate responses, and all but one of them was labeled schizophrenic. So the idea is, like, they should have been able to suss out that that wasn't true, that they weren't actually schizophrenic, but it's the power of that label. It's the power of the institution itself. Um, this label of insanity can really influence this idea, like, well, they must be insane. They're in the mental hospital. Anyway. So some critiques of labeling theory, there's a lot of propositions that still need to be tested and are, you know, adequately specified. So it's very difficult to test them in a, you know, um, kind of scientific way. So the lack of specificity makes it a problem to examine empirically. So the lack of data and empirical research evaluating labeling theory has been difficult. It's more of a theoretical, but it's less applicable. So labeling theory focuses on the reaction to and or deviant behavior, but it avoids the question of causation, right? They're looking at the reactors rather than actors. So labeling should be viewed as a perspective more so than a theory, I suppose, um, because really it's not a theory in the strictest sense because it's not really exclusively understanding the labeling itself um, or the act of labeling. It's only looking at that, not really like why were they doing it in the first place. All right, so here's this graph. I put in all these things for you from your book. Okay, so conflict perspective, because they put a bunch of different ones in the same chapter for some reason. So there's various conflict theoretical perspectives, and they all share a, a critical position concerning the existing social order, but they differ as to their conceptualization of the nature of the social order. So there's typically two forms of conflict theory. 
um, what's called pluralist or conservative, and critical radical. So um, the primary focus of conservative or pluralist conflict theories is power and the use of that power. So their theoretical framework views society as consisting of diverse interest groups that are competing for power. So one of these is George Vold, as you have here in your little thing. Um, he introduced the, the group conflict theory. And he says that a key aspect to group conflict theory is recognizing the social processes. Um, the view society is a collection of different groups that are held together by an equilibrium of opposing interests and efforts. So basically there's a struggle to try and maintain and enhance your own position within all these other competing groups. So conflict is this kind of essential component of the social process. And that it's, it's maintained that, you know, the, the process of making laws or breaking laws or law enforcement is really reflecting these fundamental conflicts between group interests as they're struggling for control of state police power. So group conflict theory is really looking at um, only those situations in which criminal behavior is the result of conflicting group interests, right? So like um, crimes arising from political protest or labor disputes or disputes within competing unions or, you know, coming from racial or ethnic clashes. Um, really just looking at another, you know, explanation for understanding crime, basically. What's called critical criminology. Um, then there's Turk. Um, Turk basically said that nothing and no one is intrinsically criminal. Criminality is de as the definition applied by individuals with the power to do so, according to illegal and extra legal as well as legal criteria. That's literally his quote. But anyway, so he says society is characterized by conflict that again comes from various groups that are trying to establish control over each other. But he says it's based on a consensus coercion balance that is maintained by the authorities within the state. So he has what's called the theory of criminalization. Right, the basic, again, the process of being labeled a criminal um, comes from the interaction between the people who enforce the law and those who violate the law. So this interaction is influenced by various social factors, right? Obviously, the cultural and social norms, um, and of course, the level of sophistication of the subject and the authority. So conflict is more likely when both the authorities and subjects are organized, like our culture. So another social factor is the power differential between enforcers and violators. So criminalization is more likely to occur when the enforcers have a great deal of power compared to the resistors. So, you know, the, basically looking at how conflict is most likely to occur when either the enforcers or resistors engage, engage in inappropriate or unsuitable behavior. So you could kind of look at this in the, in the modern context of like Black Lives Matter, right? So again, he's really stressing that kind of understanding of conflict of groups for the kind of power in the state. And then Quinney was looking at what he called his six propositions, right? Um, basically, he said that, uh, you know, to describe the social reality of crime, first you got to define it, right? That crime is a definition of human conduct that's created by people that are authorized in the culture in a politically organized society like our own. So he said, you know, the second proposition is that there's a formulation of a criminal definition. So criminal definitions describe the behaviors that conflict with the interests of the segments of society that have the power to shape political policy. And then he says that there's an application of those criminal definitions. So the definitions themselves are applied by the people in society that have the power to shape those laws and enforcement. And then um, he basically says that there's a behavior pattern that develops in relation to those definitions. So, you know, the behavior patterns themselves react to, you know, in the context of people engaging with those new definitions. And then, um, you know, and it, obviously it has to do with whether or not you're going to be defined as a criminal. Um, and then he says there's a construction of the criminal conceptions, really basically that um, conceptions of crime are constructed and diffused in the segments of society by certain means of communication, right? So uh, we learn these things through different institutions. And then what results from all of that crap is what's called the social reality of crime, right? That there's a construction for a specific formulation and application of criminal definitions so that there's a, you know, pattern that we can see related to you know, um, certain definitions and how people behave in response to that. 
and then how it kind of reaffirms the construction of those criminal conceptions. I know, it's very, there's a lot, there's a lot in there. All right, <clears throat> radical conflict perspective. So this theoretical framework views contemporary society as being dominated by a unified capitalist ruling class. So, you know, criminologists within this perspective have covered a broad range of interests, but regardless of their positions, a lot of them are, you know, kind of coming from this Marxist place. So Marxist criminology, again, obviously influenced by the economic conditions because of the Industrial Revolution that Marx was looking at. And he argued that societies are ca characterized by class struggles, as societies divided into different classes based on the means of production. So the, you know, the bourgeoisie, right, the people that own everything, the means of production, the factories, and then the proletariat, the workers, right? And so he says under this that there's some certain terms he likes to explain. Class consciousness and false consciousness. So class consciousness is an awareness of the common interests among members in a social class. So class consciousness is basically to Marx realizing you're getting screwed over, organizing together to rebel against the bourgeoisie that's keeping you down. False consciousness is what we mostly have in our culture, which is not being aware of common interests. So like, for example, working class Americans, there's a large racial wedge between a lot of working class Americans, um, even kind of leading back to the old labor movements, um, where powerful interests really didn't want black and brown people to organize with white people to realize that they're all being screwed by the same capitalistic problems. And if they came together, their unions would be so strong that um, they would definitely be able to demand things of these corporations that they can't do since they're so fractured, but they've kind of given them a false consciousness, this idea of whiteness, this idea of white superiority that makes it so it's more important to remain poor than make sure that, you know, your workers' rights are, are handled. Like, right, it's the same reason why people that are very poor and need Obamacare would vote against Obamacare because they don't want that Obamacare to go to support black and brown people that they think are quote unquote unworthy based on, you know, their white supremacist narratives. So anyway, that's false consciousness. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a little rant there. False consciousness is just this idea that the way it is is the best way it should be, right? The capitalism is a great thing. And if we just work hard enough, we could be rich too, right? Which is just BS. So anyway, Criminologists have looked at Marxist ideologies in a couple ways, right? They've looked at how the law is often a tool of the ruling class, how all crime um, in capitalist countries is a product of class struggle, which is, uh, we'll get back to that. And that scholars need to address the relationship between the mode of production and understanding crime, right? This kind of 1%, 99% um, extreme wealth concentration the fact that we're all kind of subordinated into these um, awful jobs and roles that we don't like and how um, that's all to serve someone else's oppression. Anyway, so um, yeah, basically there's a lot of, um, you know, people that were looking through this kind of perspective, um, trying to look at how, um, you know, class is a big part of this. So, you know, your book talks about William uh, Chemlis and Robert Seidman that were, you know, looking at um, using a conflict perspective to look at the laws as a tool of the of the ruling class, right? Looking at um, the connections between the use of law and legislators, right? Kind of like what we're talking about with the war on drugs, how um, people can get reelected by um, saying they're tough on crime. Um, Colvin and Pauli uh, integrated structural Marxist theory as part of this too, basically talking about how um, you know. The, depending on your your life, right, your um, how, where you work, what your family's like, what your school's like, what your peer groups are like, that's going to affect what kind of social class um, expectations you have, right? So typically, um, if you are a child of the working class versus a child of white collar workers, you're going to have different expectations that are put on you in child rearing and that's going to affect your peer associations which can then later affect you know what kind of situations you come into contact with the criminal justice system um and basically yeah there's a whole bunch of them in your book that i'm not testing you on those but basically blah 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 capitalism um you know this idea that that um in a lot of ways 
that the social conditions that capitalism produces um, is kind of the problem that they see, really. Okay, so some of the um, critiques, right? So research using a conflict perspective can be categorized into one of two broad approaches. Uh, studies examining laws that are formulated in the interests of those in power and studies examining the differential processing of certain individuals in the criminal justice system. So those things we can see, right? Um, we can see how laws that are formulated in the interests of those in power, like the 100 to 1 rule that we saw in the film, um, or we can look at differential processing of certain individuals, like the fact that your age, your gender, your race, your social class will affect your sentencing, or even if you're sentenced at all. So, um, yeah, basically when it comes to the critiques, um, you know, there's some limitations, right? Obviously, <laughs> um, while they have done some research using these um, with multivariate analysis, it's still kind of difficult to test empirically. Um, some research studying it has been able to distinguish between, has been unable to see it but distinguish between other alternative explanations. So a few attempts have been made to develop and test well-constructed conflict theory. Really, I think my biggest obvious critique is the idea that all crime is coming from the capitalist organization of society. Like for sure, capitalist organization of society is causing like a lot of crime, but like a crime of passion, right? How does that come from? Anyway, whatever, that's just my critique. Okay, so additional critical theories. Um, you have peacemaking criminology, so this incorporates three different intellectual traditions, religious, feminist, and critical theories. So generally, peacemaking criminology contends that rather than using punishment and retribution as a way of social control, society should try and, you know, attempt some sort of reconciliation through mediation and dispute settlement, right? So, you know, we should look at how people can, you know, through what they call the peacemaking criminological theoretical model or whatever, um, you know, they, which again, it has five basic elements itself, the social structure, the crime, the social harm, the system itself, and the peacemaking alternative, where basically they say there's three themes within peacemaking criminology. So looking at the type of crime or social harm that is caused by the crime, looking at a type of peacemaking framework or perspective, and really looking at alternatives, peacemaking alternatives to the kind of system that we have now that doesn't um, necessarily work. I mean, when you look at uh, recidivism rates or things like that, then, uh, you know, locking someone up for the rest of their life for something, um, how does that then help the community heal? Does it? I don't know. Anyway. Um, then there's restorative justice. So restorative justice refers to the repair of justice. <clears throat> basically, it's like a multi-sided approach to this. So basically, it emphasizes that the victim, the community, and the offender should be all kind of um, rehabilitated in a certain way. So, you know, restorative justice perspective is basically saying that, you know, crime is a bad thing. It's an act against another person. And that, you know, control for that crime is really lying primarily within a community. It's not necessarily coming from the criminal justice system like... Um, like the uh, uh, um, retributive kind of stances, right? They say that you know punishment is not enough to change the behavior, right? And that it's really disruptive to the community harmony and good relationships within the harmony within the community. So victims are really central to the process of resolving crime. If the offender is defined as capable to make that kind of reparation, then they can focus on solving problems like what can be done in the future. Right? There's a lot of emphasis on dialogue and talking these kind of things out, right? And basically just trying to, you know, finding a way to reduce harm and respond to the consequences of that, of, of their behavior. And then there's left realism. So left realism is basically, um, the, this guy Jock Young came up with it, um, talking about how we could transform criminological thinking. So, you know, instead of really looking at the way that we've been looking at these problems in the past, that we should be looking at how, um, you know, specifically the kind of crisis that's going on due to rising crime rates and how the, when it comes to basically finding a way to 
effectively criminalize what someone is doing, um, it's not necessarily penalizing people appropriately. So there's this kind of problem where um, there's often the, the people who are in prison themselves are not necessarily um, like reforming or <laughs> like see what they do is wrong or anything like that, right? Um, or, and at the same time, the role of the police, uh, they argue, has to be reappraised as well. That, that they say that we have to understand that there's a certain kind of victimization going on um, in relation to crimes that's often not noticed. We focus more on the punishment, but we don't really look at, well, what about those being victimized? And so, you know, they are looking at a growing public demand for there to be more efficiency and accountability when it comes to issues of public service, instead of um, just kind of punishment system as it is and locking people up. So basically, they're saying other theories have been incomplete um, because they're really just looking at one part of the picture, right? So they're saying usually theories are looking at just like the state itself or the public or the offender or the victim, but they're really looking at all of those things at all levels so that they can have certain policy recommendations that they can give based on that.